this is the second of the two-part series on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors i would strongly advise viewers to watch the part one so that this section makes more sense and the information is more easily understandable in my video we will focus on the diagnosis and a broad outline of treatment of pancreatic nets in diagnosis we wish to locate the primary tumor and whether or not it has spread obtain a biopsy find out whether the tumor is secreting hormones and whether the tumors carry receptors for a certain naturally occurring hormone, somatostatin, as well as measuring markers of activity of the tumor. The treatment will focus on the general principles, hormone-based treatment, surgery, and treatment of the non-operable disease. The conventional scans, such as CT, MRI scan, and ultrasound scan, would conveniently locate the tumor, as well as give evidence of its spread. Let's look at some scans now. This is a CT scan, and it shows a large pancreatic tumor, probably non-functional in the body and tail of the pancreas as shown over here. This is a CT scan which shows spread to the liver. This is the normal liver and these are tumor deposits seen in the liver from a pancreatic primary. Unlike other tumors, it is essential to biopsy a PNET just so that we can know what grade the tumor is. G1 and early G2 are good prognosis and G3 has poor prognosis indeed. And this has an implication on treatment options. The biopsy is obtained by way of an endoscopic ultrasound. This is a flexible tube as shown over here with an ultrasound scanner attached at the tip and a biopsy forceps just exits next to it. This is passed down the patient's gullet into the stomach and it parks itself in the stomach or the small bowel and then take a direct biopsy of the tumor as I've drawn over here. If the tumor is spread to the liver, then an ultrasound guided direct biopsy is sometimes preferable. Functional scans with molecules that have binding sites on the tumors are invaluable. The older scan is called the octreotide scan and the most latest generation are the gallium scans. Here's an example of the gallium scan where the tumor is detected by way of a fusion scan. The first is a radionuclear image of the whole body and then this is superimposed on the CT scan giving rise to a composite picture and an accurate location of both the primary as well as the secondary tumor. Less than half of these tumors will produce hormones because they arise from hormone producing cells. It is imperative that we examine the blood and sometimes the urine for high levels of hormones, which in each individual tumor type will be a different hormone so that a composite set of these tests are sent off for each patient. Even the non-hormone secreting tumors produce chemicals which serve as markers of tumor activity such as the chromogranin A, ghrelin and chromogranin B. The complexity of the tests involved and decision making would be obvious by now and the compelling argument for getting treatment in a center that is equipped to deal with these tumors. Now let's look at the treatment options. There are general principles deployed in the treatment of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the first one, of course, is the state of the patient. So you will only tailor the treatment to the patient. If the patients are unfit for any kind of treatment, then it is futile to take this matter any further forward. A biopsy is essential to establish the grade of the tumor so that you know how malignant the tumor is and which treatment to deploy. You would wish to know the extent of the tumor, whether it can be removed with surgery and whether it has spread to the liver as shown over here. So this is the primary tumor and it commonly spreads to the liver, and this would mean a different surgical strategy. Whether or not the tumor produces hormones causing symptoms that ought to be controlled, the levels brought down. In most patients, if not all, the use of somatostatin, which is a naturally occurring molecule, has been found to be extremely useful, both in terms of controlling the hormone secretion, as well as in controlling the tumor. There are other medications, such as diazoxide for high insulin levels and proton pump inhibitors for high gastrin levels which lead to stomach ulcers. These would help in symptom control. Let's now move to surgery. Once a patient has been considered to be a good candidate for surgery and for G1 or early G2 cancers, surgical therapy would, prolo would prolong life. It could be conventional operations such as removing the distal part of the pancreas called distal pancreatectomy. This part of the pancreas say the tumor is over here, or a pancreatic or duodenectomy. If the patient is here in that case, the bowel tube, the gallbladder, part of the small bowel or stomach, all of this removed along with the head of the pancreas called pancreatic or duodenectomy. Rarely the whole of the pancreas may be removed to called total pancreatectomy. For more benign tumors, these could be removed locally 
by removing smaller part of the pancreas around the tumor with the tumor itself or central pancreatectomy where two halves either side are preserved but the middle part of the pancreas is removed. These operations can be performed with minimally invasive means or through an open operation. Large liver deposits as seen over here can be removed with surgery. This is the initial scan and this is, these are the scans a year later where the tumor has been successfully removed. Smaller tumors as drawn over here may be treated and destroyed with heat by inserting a needle into the tumor and heating it up until the heat destroys it. This is a technique called ablation and it is performed under ultrasound guidance. Further, the inflow or the blood flow supplying these big tumors can be stopped with radiological means called embolization to try and destroy the tumor that way, especially if these are producing hormones. It is important to realize the difference between the common variety of pancreatic cancer and pancreatic net where a primary pancreatic, pancreatic tumor may be removed with surgery as well as treating the metastases, which is not the case with the more common variety of pancreatic cancer. Now let's look at other treatment options for patients with highly malignant cancers. The grade three tumors in particular will require attempts at controlling the disease by other means such as chemotherapy. This is a highly complex and evolving field and several different types and generations of treatments are being evaluated currently. These patients may benefit from a combination of these treatments, such as chemotherapy, molecular targeted therapy, drugs that inhibit tyrosine kinase, mTOR inhibitors. There is yet a further treatment which has shown some promise, peptide receptor ligand therapy. And these molecules are tagged with radioactivity, which then fixate to the tumors and destroyed by that means. Finally, and most importantly, those caring for these patients must not lose sight of the most important factor, which is the quality of life and identifying the effect of the treatment on the patient and whether or not it is worthwhile to consider pursuing sometimes toxic management options with little benefit. Towards the end, I would reiterate yet again that these are highly complex tumor conditions that require teamwork, expertise, and facilities to get the optimum outcomes for patients. Earlier on in the video, I had promised to briefly talk about a very famous person. So here's a case study, 49 year old male, first diagnosed with functional PNET tumor in 2003, underwent alternative therapies for about nine months, then had an operation to have the tumor removed the following year. Unfortunately, had recurrence in the liver in 2007, underwent a liver transplant in 2009, and passed away of progressive recurrent disease in 2011. It was Steve Jobs, an outstandingly brilliant man. We do not know the intricacies of his treatment or the tumor other than what I have highlighted.